holding the powerful accountable from Washington, D.C. to right here in southern New England. This is 10 News Conference with Gene Valicente. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gene Valicente. This is 10 News Conference, a special decision 2022 primary debate with the Democrats for lieutenant governor. Current lieutenant governor Sabina Matos declined to participate. However, we have a podium ready for her in case she wants a dart in. With us today, her challengers, State Representative Deb Ruggiero. She represents Jamestown. Also, State Senator Cynthia Mendes. She represents East Providence. They're with us. We're dispensing with opening statements to get right to the questions. All right, ladies, thanks for coming in. One question right off the top. Where is Sabina Matos? Is she afraid to face the two of you? Let's begin with Deb Ruggiero. Thank you, Gene, so much for uh, having us. This is such an important part of the democratic process, and I want to thank uh, State Senator uh, Mendez mm -hmm. for joining us. It's disappointing that the lieutenant governor is not here this morning because the, the public deserves to know where people stand on issues. This is part of the democratic process, mm -hmm. so it is disappointing, but I'm excited to be here. It's an honor to run for lieutenant governor, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. So thank you for having us. All right, uh, Senator Mendes, uh, actually, she said she had a scheduling issue, couldn't be here. I'm looking at her Twitter earlier this morning, about 37 minutes ago. She was at a, a pre-apprenticeship program. I'm seeing about 20 people in the room. She certainly had a larger audience here. Where is Sabina Matos? Is she afraid of you? That's a really great question, Jean. Um, you know, I'm a working mom. I'm a senator, and I'm running for state office. Um, and I made time to be here. In addition to that, mm -hmm. I have boxes stacked up in my living room right now because as soon as I'm done here, I need to go pack them into the minivan and take my child to college. Um, and I still found time to be here because it's a priority. Sabina Matos is um, an appointed lieutenant governor, not elected. Um, no one's entitled mm -hmm. to their position. Uh, we have to talk to voters, and, and, um, no, and that is very, very important. No one should feel entitled to their position. Well, mm -hmm. maybe it's a strategy. You know, the latest poll had her a few points ahead. And uh, Patrick Kennedy never debated. He would do one appearance on a Pawtucket closed circuit, well, a cable, a small cable show. But that was it. So it's a strategy. But Gene, the problem is you are an appointed person. She's never been elected to statewide office. And I'm sure the strategy is you can slip into the office, run out the clock, run under the wings of the current governor. Um, and that's not appropriate. People need to know where you stand on issues. Look, I'm a 14-year legislator. I run a marketing and advertising business. And I know how everybody is pressed for time. But as the appointed lieutenant governor, it's too bad that she's not here. It is disappointing. Mm -hmm. And I would say, when she said that she's too busy being the lieutenant governor, you know, one of the responsibilities of the lieutenant governor is the long-term care coordinating council. Really important when we talk about aging in place mm -hmm. and aging with dignity. And three of those meetings have been canceled in the last five months. Also under the purview of the lieutenant governor's office is emergency management. Right. Two of those meetings have been canceled over the last several months. That's so, an advisory position, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll get to that. We'll okay, get to the duties of the, of the lieutenant governor. You know, yesterday, the governor put out a news release insisting that Dr. Munoz, who was in our debate the other day, uh, be included in Channel 12's debate. They're leaving him out. Should he have put a news release out insisting that his hand-picked lieutenant governor, Sabina Matos, show up here? Senator Mendes. <laughs> I believe all voices should participate in this democratic process to talk to voters, be clear about what you stand for, what you're willing to do, and defend your record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I believe every single person that is brave enough to enter into this ring um, come with transparency. Um, I expect that from the current lieutenant governor. I'm disappointed by her today. Um, and I expect that from everyone that's running for governor. Right. I, had she uh, showed up, I would have asked her about her vote to defund the police as the city council president in Providence. Let me ask you about that, Senator Mendes. Are you defund the police? No, I'm not. Um, I, I the, take a very clear stance on one thing, and that is accountability. Um, it, right now in Rhode Island, we're one of the very few states in the country mm -hmm. um, that has something called the Law Officers' Bill of Rights. Um, it's called LEABOR, and Leobor, it's, a special, yes. it's a special bill that gives um, special process right. um, when a law officer's commit a crime. And 
as a public official, I don't believe any of us should get a separate set of due process. The lieutenant governor and Governor uh, McKee are under investigation right now, and I, and I believe they're going to go through normal due process. I don't think that any public official um, and public servant right. gets a separate set of internal um, process. Let me that's just the, let me just be clear. The, mm -hmm. the governor is under FBI investigation, mm -hmm. Their administration. Not, not the lieutenant yeah. governor. Yeah. All right. Um, are you reallocate the police? And just answer that quickly. It's, you're not defund. Are you reallocate, redistribute funds? My reimagine. My <laughs> um, I've never heard that term. Um, oh, I've heard it from all the camp. We are yeah. reimagined. No, I'm, I've been really, really clear. My priority on policing is Leobor and making sure okay. that everyone's held accountable. Um, and, and the police officers' budgets are handled right. on the municipal level anyway. So Leobor is what we can do on the state level. Your running mate, Matt Brown, said you are no cash bail. Mm. Are you? Is that correct? No cash bail? Yeah. So one of the things that we have sat we have seen is that it leaves us fundamentally unsafe. It's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of public safety that some people can uh, get out of jail because they can afford it and they can pay their way out. Mm -hmm. If a judge feels like someone is unsafe, they should be detained. Okay. Um, and they shouldn't be able to get out of it just because they have more money than someone else. All right. Now, Senator, uh, Representative Ruggiero, I want to give you equal time. That's fine. Uh, she says she's not defund the police. She's not reimagined, hasn't heard that, but is no cash bail. Go ahead. Well, first of all, I don't believe in defunding the police. I believe very strongly in diversifying the police. The police should represent the community that they serve, you know, that, that they serve and that they protect. Um, I believe that we all want safe neighborhoods, right? One of the things that I worked on, a great policy that is now law, is community policing with mental health professionals. I worked with the Police Chiefs Association, I worked with the Mental mm -hmm. Health Association, the public, the public uh, defenders, and what we did is just because somebody has a mental um, situation, a crisis, it is not by any means a crime. So we were able to put mental health professionals, we did it in Newport, Middletown, with Newport County Mental Health, and up in Providence. I know uh, Colonel Clements is doing it uh, mm -hmm. as well with uh, the Providence Center. So it's really important that community policing takes part in all of our neighborhoods. I do agree that Libor needs reforming. Police Officer Bill of Rights. Yes. Yeah, the, yep. the law enforcement, yes, the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. It needs reforming, and there was also some good ideas to put, um, I think it was the Rhode Island Human Rights Commission on, okay. as well as the Dean of the Roger Williams uh, Law School as yep. well. So those kinds of things are important because the police are municipal employees. So I believe strongly that yes, reform, but not defunding, diversifying. What we about? Need, it, it should definitely um, you know, be part of the community policing. What about no cash bail? You know, the president is running around. Fund the police, hire more police. No cash bail, is that controversial? Um, I think it is. It's something, I mean, we all certainly could look at things, but right now I think, you know, we have to make sure that everyone has access to the um, system that's important in our judiciary. All right, let's hold it there. It's time for our first break, but when we come back, we have two more segments, and we'll run through a lot of topics with our candidates, uh, Democrat candidates for Lieutenant Governor, minus Sabina Matos, the Lieutenant Governor, right back after this. Welcome back to our Democrat debate for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Senator Mendes, the Lieutenant Governor's job, you know, cool moose, uh, Bob Healy, he said, I'll run, I'll get rid of it. It's a million dollar waste of money. It's nothing but a four year platform for you to run for governor. A million dollars of the taxpayer promotional money. Is that what it is? Um, it's not. It's been an underutilized, underused office, um, but it's a very important office. We saw that firsthand um, when Governor McKee was the former lieutenant governor. We need someone that's ready to govern day one. Um, that's the first and foremost job for lieutenant governor. And then you oversee several commissions and, ca and um, committees. But in addition to that, you need someone with a vision to connect to the community. As a community advocate, someone that's worked in the community, one of my top priorities is bringing in voices that haven't been heard in the process and being able to connect them and having voices of power in the legislature, in governing, um, and prioritizing voices that have been left out. How long have you been in the Senate? I've been, this is my first term in the Senate, so I'm completing my term in the Senate in East Providence and Pawtucket, um, but leading has been something right. I've, been, I've been doing for a very long time. So 2020, 2021? 2022. 2022. Currently so a senator. About two and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, your, is your opponent ready to become governor? 
Well, I happen to believe that experience matters and readiness matters. I've served 14 years in the legislature. I'm also a small businesswoman. Mm -hmm. I'm somebody who takes ideas, moves them into action. It's what I've done throughout my career. My four E's have been my policy, Gene, the economy, education, environment, and our elderly. I have framed policy from co-sponsoring marriage equality, defending a woman's right to reproductive health, to making sure that I've championed many of our renewable energy laws. So when I looked at the statutory requirements of the Lieutenant Governor's Office, I thought, wow, my experience really codes well with this office. It is a very important office with untapped potential, and there are three really important areas. Just One, quickly on that, because I want, go ahead. I understand, but the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council is where we frame our aging policy. We right. have not seen policy or legislation come out of that office in over a decade. Small business. Rhode Island's largest business is small business. Right. And the third is the emergency management. So this is an office where we really need to have somebody who understands the legislature, if you can understand the legislature, yeah. and I've been there for 14 years, so I would be a bridge between the legislature and the governor's okay. office. Those last two that you mentioned were advisory roles. In mm -hmm. fact, over the past 30 years, I remember the creation of those, and some people said they just need to give the lieutenant governor something to do. I'll let you respond to that. But I think she's saying 14 years in the legislature versus two or two and a half. And also being a say? consensus builder. I said in the Mendes? Yeah, so I think it's important to take in a scope of someone's experience in their community. Right now, we have seen um, and we know what career politicians offer us in this state. It's time we have community leaders. That's why I'm supporting teachers that are running for office right now, nurses that are running for mm -hmm. office right now, social workers, environmental scientists. We need to center the voices of actual Rhode Islanders in government um, and have a truly representative democracy. Right. In addition to that, um, experience is important, but if you're disconnected to the community, it can be harmful. We've seen um, Rep has voted uh, for 38 studios. Rep has voted for Medicaid cuts. Those were damaging to Rhode Islanders, and we need someone who knows the impact of how those pieces of legislation impact everyday people and have your finger on the pulse of the needs of Rhode Island. Is she factually correct? Well, there were certain things that certainly when 38 Studios came out years ago, that was something that was considered because it was put under the guise. As time developed, much like what we're going to see with Tidewater, right? And we'll talk yeah. about that, I'm sure. Uh, things start to change. And as far as Medicaid and as far as helping with seniors, I have been such an advocate in many of those areas. And spending eight years on the House Finance Committee, I've been able to frame policy that has really made a difference. I mean, I understand yeah. the state budget. You know, we put more money into our senior centers. One of the bills that passed this year that I've worked on for the past two years is the senior tax relief bill. You know, we have seniors in our state, 65 plus, who are living on less than $35,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And this circuit breaker law, which I worked with with AARP, literally trips if you're making 35000 less, you're entitled to a tax relief right, from the me, state for $600. Let me just back This as, is as really the, important. As the fact finder, you said she voted to cut Medicaid. Medi Medicaid, yes. We've seen a number of times the leaders of this state cut Medicaid. Did you um, do that? We, we need the, to relook at Medicaid. The, oh, no, I'm asking you, did you? She said you voted to cut Medicaid. Yes or no? True I, or false? I don't know if it's true or false. Well, I know well, you, that we've you, made, hold on a minute. You're the legislator. Certain, She's, she we've knows. made certain you, decisions. I've got a pressure and, now. And I understand. And we've made certain vote to decisions. Cut? Let, let her, let's and get an I have to here. say, it's something that we need to look at, and it's all under the purview of the lieutenant governor's office. We Can need I, to relook at our Medicaid spending. We need to. We are 20. We are. We spend only 26 percent right now yeah. of our Medicaid dollars on home care in this state. I understand and there are very that, few but dollars. I, I, I've worked in health care. I worked and particularly in the dental field. We have over 126,000 children on right smiles in this state. We haven't increased the Medicaid rates since 1992. I was 12 years old. I know from both professionally, mm -hmm. but also from being a parent and also a community leader, the impact of those Medicaid cuts. And they've we happened need to and do they've that. happened while yeah. she's been in office and she's voted for them. And that's harmful. And I know the impact of, not, of people in Rhode yeah. Island, including children. You've gone, over, you've gone over her record. You see the votes she voted. Yeah. And I, I, I encourage say, people to fact check. And I absolutely believe that we need to recalibrate Medicaid spending. Okay. We're ranked 40 second in this state. It's something that's under the purview of the lieutenant governor's office, and we haven't seen any of that in decades. 
I, as a lieutenant governor, believe that we'll recalibrate Medicaid. We're right. going to put in legislation. We also need to start okay. caring for the people who care for those, the caregivers. And that is what we need to do moving forward. All right, we need to we take a quick... We can't look back. We need to move forward in our state. We need to quick, a, take a quick break, but she said you voted to cut. You're not confirming that for me. You should know your own votes. And I understand what we need to do okay. moving All our right. state forward. That's, that's your answer. We've gone over it. Uh, we'll go over a lot more when we come back. Welcome back to our debate for Lieutenant Governor. The Democrats vying for that are with us, with the exception of Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, who told us quite some time ago she has a scheduling conflict. We have a podium open for her in case an engagement uh, ends early and she wants a dart. In the meantime, Senator, uh, Senator Mendes is with us, also State Representative Deb Ruggiero. Uh, you've outlined you believe in the office, you think we need it, uh, what the office does and what you would like to do with it. Uh, but most importantly, you are there in case we need... We need to elevate you to the governor's job. It doesn't happen a lot, but it just happened with Governor McKee. Uh, so what kind of a governor would you be? Would you keep roadworks in place and the truck tolls, Rep. Ruggiero? Well, first of all, Gene, I would be the kind of governor who absolutely is a consensus builder. It's how I've worked for the last 14 years. It's how I got so much policy done between renewable energy laws, marriage equality, and protecting a woman's right, right. to choose. As far as road works goes, a lot of that is contingent on federal dollars. So the answer is yes, we would okay. have to keep that in place because we don't want to jeopardize federal spending. Truck tolls, too? The trucks use a lot of the roads, and really at the time before Roadworks contributed only about 30%, right. and it was really put on many of the taxpayers to do a lot of the funding. So that was an important program that we put forth yeah. to make sure that we have safe roads. One of the reasons Rhode Island has been ranked so poorly in business recommendations is because of the infrastructure, and that infrastructure includes roads and bridges. Yes. Really important. The answer is yes. Yes and yes. I was getting a text. Maybe that's from Commerce Secretary Ramondo. She liked your answers. Uh, <laughs> or, or maybe that was the lieutenant governor. She's now joining maybe it's the lieutenant governor. She's on my us. way. On her I'm way. Coming. Yes. She's going to make it. <laughs> Roadworks. Uh, do you keep Ramondo's blueprint in place, fixing the roads, fixing the bridges? And do you keep truck tolls in place? Uh, so our, our roads desperately need some work, and I'm very grateful that we're seeing federal dollars heading our way in order to address that. The truck tolls, I believe right now, uh, last I checked, there was a court case pending about those. I'm very curious about what the judges in that case um, uh, where they land yeah. on that. Um, I've been talking to Rhode Islanders and there are, they have a lot of concerns. Truck tolls don't happen to be one of them, so I'm gonna wait and see when I hear a strong um, verdict from what the judges think. Um, Rhode Islanders are concerned about other things. They were co concerned about healthcare, they're concerned about housing, they're concerned about climate, they're mm -hmm. concerned about a woman's right to choose, they're concerned about equal quality education. I haven't heard much about truck tolls, but I'm willing to listen. <laughs> we have heard a lot about affordable housing. You camped yeah. out at the State House for a length of time yeah. uh, to draw attention to the homeless problem. Yeah. Now, Governor McKee gave several million dollars to Crossroads to put the homeless in the Nilo Hotel over the yeah. objections of the neighbors who lived there and were felt unsafe with people going over their lawns and looking in their windows. Yeah. Was that fair to them? We all are concerned about the homeless, but was it fair to open a homeless shelter in a hotel in a neighborhood? Would you do that? That's a really great question, Jean. And what we have to realize is that what happened that winter um, was something that's happened far too long in this country. Underfunded organizations and underpaid caseworkers have to scramble to fit, find solutions mm -hmm. and make a plan when the leaders of this state have been looking the other way and neglecting people. We've seen record number of people unhoused. We've seen rent increases 30, 34 um, percent. And we have teachers. I know of a teacher living in their car. Okay. We have to address housing. This Governor McKee did not do that. And the organizations that that uh, did their best to address it, had to scramble and okay. fix his mess. But with regard to putting him in the nylo, I, I'm going to take that a yes. I, I, I believe, once again, that okay. the people that have been doing this work are, oh. are under-resourced, underpaid, and are scrambling to make solutions when the leaders of the state are not giving them solutions and not giving them options, because I think they fundamentally don't care. Okay. Uh, Rep. Ruggiero, you know what the governor did? And sat, by the way, he'll do it again. He told me that. He wasn't backing off that. Was that the right thing yeah. to do, to First open a all, homeless shelter in the neighborhood with homes right across the street? They didn't ask for that. 
we need to have better communication. It's, it's unfortunate that that wasn't communicated in a way mm -hmm. with the community, and that sometimes happens a lot, where we need to really get people involved and, and actually discuss it, okay? We have an issue with homelessness. We also have one out of three Rhode Islanders who can't afford to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. We have a housing crisis here, and I was really happy to be part of house finance when we put $250 million in the budget. It's a long-term plan. Mm -hmm. And we have some short-term plans, too, you know, with the accessory dwelling units that we worked on with AARP. We have a housing crisis in this state. We have 20,000 units short. We have $10 million in a very innovative program um, for what's called community housing that hopefully will have 200 units coming out. Mm -hmm. But I have deep, deep respect for the folks at Crossroads Rhode Island and trying to help those who are homeless. Okay. I mean, I also just want to mention that, you I have know, two minutes before Jean, we go to just, closing. Yep. Just so you know, this is very, very near and dear to me. As you know, and many Rhode Islanders know, this is the work I did before I ever got into politics. I never planned to get into politics. Right. I actively served folks that were unhoused, women that were suffering in domestic violence situations. That's what I did with my time. And so we, I, I have built very strongly with my running mate and local okay. people running for office, a strong plan. Tens of thousands of affordable housing. Cap on rent increases. People cannot afford the rent increases I've right got now. to hold you there, 4%. Senator, because yes. we're tied and on also, top. Deb, take a few say, more seconds and we're going to closing. Go I, just, I just want to say that it's interesting because she did not vote for the $250 million for affordable housing, and she did not vote for any of the housing bills. So it's really did. important that... I actually let, did. Let her finish. Let mm -hmm. her finish. Go no, ahead. I just want to say that you did not vote for the budget. I, I very much encourage people to fact check. Um, not this past session. I did vote for the budget this session. The previous session, there were big gaps. We had a lot of money to dispense. They did not dispense it wisely. I voted for individual bills and, and, and very much championed those individual bills, but the budget itself was wrong. But you wrong didn't vote for the pay for success. A which was the ago. homeless program that we put in last year's budget. That's all. No I just one, think that, no one that can deny my deep fair. compassion and passion for those that are unhoused. I've been dedicating uh, okay. my life Absolutely. to it, and I'll be doing we, we it no matter what. We all feel that way. We all very much recognize that we have a crisis. I mean, I always say, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. And I've cared deeply about so many of these policy issues and look forward to being the next lieutenant governor who's going to be a consensus builder to work with people so we can solve some of these issues. We haven't seen okay. legislation in over a decade. Legislation is is what creates policy. Policy is how we change people's lives. All right, we've got to go to our closing statements. It flew by. Uh, Senator yeah. Mendes, address this camera. You have one minute. Thank you, Jean. Um, the leaders of this state are offering a Rhode Island for some. Equal quality education, but only if your child lives in the right zip code. Health care, but only if you can afford a hospital bill. Housing, but only if your family can handle a 30% rent increase tax giveaways to their rich political buddies and um, to their luxury developers. It's a problem. Um, the leaders of this state accept these things. They accept that some children, some kids, will suffer with asthma because of corporate polluters dumping pollution into their community. They accept that some teachers will have to work a second job just to make ends meet. And they accept that some families, although work, parents that are working well over 40 hours a week still can't put food on their family's table. I am the only lieutenant governor in this race who is committed to having a Rhode Island that works for all of us, not just the fortunate few. If you share that commitment, I humbly ask for your vote on September 13th. Thank you, Senator Mendes. Closing statements, uh, Representative Ruggiero? Thank you, Jean, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's disappointing that the lieutenant governor could not join us today because this is the democratic process. The office of lieutenant governor has so much untapped potential. I put ideas into action. It's what I've done my entire career as a small business owner, as a TV sales manager, and as a legislator for the past 14 years. I will be a lieutenant governor that works with the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council because we need to make sure that we are no longer 42nd in the nation when it comes to our grandparents and parents aging with dignity at home. So we need to relook at Medicaid. I also believe we need to help our small businesses. Rhode Island's largest business is small business. I will serve as a bridge between the governor's office and the state legislature because I understand how to work on legislation. I'll work with whomever you elect as the next governor in the state of Rhode Island. 
experience matters, readiness matters, and I'm ready on day one. And I thank you so much for joining us. And thank I you. respectfully ask for your vote on September 13th. Thank, thank you. you. Rep thank you, Representative. Thanks to both of you for thank coming you. in. It's a pleasure to see you. Nice. I wish same we could here. say the same for our Lieutenant Governor, but she did not show up. The time came. I've got to run. I'll catch you on the news at six. Have a good rest of your day.